Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. As you know, Thursday night and into Friday, we had heavy rains in parts of Addison County. In fact, it was a month's worth of rain, six inches in just a three hour period. In Rutland, swift water teams who were pre deployed completed over 20 rescue operations. And Commissioner Morrison will have more on our on ongoing emergency response efforts. These new storms also had an impact on our infrastructure. And we'll get a transportation update from Secretary Flynn and the Federal Highway Administration, who have been key partners during the emergency and will be equally as important as we rebuild. It's hard to believe that it's only been about a month since we uh, experienced the first of our severe flooding. Admittedly, it seems like it's been much longer it seems, um, seems that we have teams across the state uh, that have continued to respond to the many challenges uh, and intense storms we experience almost every day. I want to again express my sincere appreciation to all those who stepped up from town road crews on the front lines, VTRANS and contractors getting main roads opened back up, our emergency operations center workers, volunteers, and many, many, many others. Even though we continue to face obstacles because of our oversaturated soils, the next, the next month or so will be an opportunity to focus on cleanup needs and efforts. That means finishing our work on debris removal, including that of the condemned mobile homes and immediate infrastructure work. This includes the incredibly challenging work by our municipal road crews. The numbers you've heard from us before and will again today from Secretary Flynn represent only our state roads. But we have we know there are many municipal roads that were hard hit as well. And now that we're catching up on our state roads, uh, VTRANS will continue reaching out to local partners to see how we can assist and help them. After we get through this phase heading into the fall, we need to be, be at a point where the conversation is more about recovery, mitigation work, and revitalization. From my perspective, that means merging our flood recovery efforts and the community revitalization work we'd already begun using historic federal ARPA funds. As you know, we dedicated hundreds of millions to this work for things like housing, water, sewer, stormwater infrastructure, climate change mitigation, economic development, and more. Lifting communities up, especially those left behind for far too long, is even more important now. And coordinating these efforts is how we can best build back stronger. That's why I named Doug Farnham, who is with us today, as Chief Recovery Officer. As Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Administration, Doug was charged with coordinating our federal ARPA funding programs. And with his vast and diverse background, he's the right person to make sure we do all of this work in the most effective and efficient way possible. We know we have a long road ahead, but I'm confident Vermonters will continue to pull together and keep Vermont strong. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good morning and thanks for being here. We've continued to have unsettled weather, necessitating staging and deployment of our swift water rescue assets. Last week, teams were busy on Thursday night in Middlebury and Friday night in Rutland. Localized flooding necessitated the evacuation of 35 individuals. There was one injury reported and one swift water boat was significantly damaged during a rescue. This brings the number of lives rescued to 216 in the past month. Additionally, teams have assisted with 162 evacuations. For context, a normal year sees approximately six or so rescues and approximately 30 evacuations. During the same time frame in the past month, hazmat teams have responded to 90 calls. For context, last year in 2022, there were 135 total calls. And our rapid assessment teams have inspected 880 homes and businesses. In short, the Department of Public Safety, assisted by both in-state and out-of-state partners, has completed more missions this past month than we normally see in many years combined. Until today's rain ends, 
We will continue to have urban search and rescue assets, which includes swift water rescue teams staged in the western part of the state. As of last night, 211 has received just shy of 6,000 reports of damage to residences and businesses. 85% of the calls were from individuals, and 15% or 912 calls were from businesses. Washington County has accounted for one third of all 211 reports, with just over 2,000 calls coming from Washington County. And a little bit about debris. As of yesterday, 4,432 tons of debris had been removed under the state contract. This is on top of all of the debris that has been coordinated for removal at the local level. There are currently four municipalities using the state contract and six more towns that will be joining the state contract work by week's end. If your community is struggling to create a plan for debris removal or you're having trouble accessing a hauler, please have your local emergency management director contact the State Emergency Operations Center for assistance. Debris removal is a top priority right now and, we, and will be for the next few weeks. In addition to the obvious areas related to high density neighborhoods and business districts, we want to locate and assist those who live on the outskirts or back roads and may need help with debris removal. Toward that end, we are working with six local emergency medical services agencies throughout the state to help prioritize and coordinate volunteer assistance for our most vulnerable, vulnerable citizens. These agencies will also be working with the Agency of Transportation to help identify overlooked flood debris and arrange for the removal of debris. Lastly, a few words about hazardous materials. The State of Vermont Hazardous Materials Collection Site at the former Middlesex State Police Barracks at 1078 U.S. Route 2 in Middlesex will remain open daily from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. through this Saturday, August 12th, and we will be able to collect household hazardous wastes, and these are products labeled caution, toxic, danger, hazard, warning, poisonous, reactive, corrosive, or flammable, and that's including things like paint, charcoal lighter, oven cleaner, drain cleaner, pesticides, and propane or other gas cylinders. Businesses with hazardous material can bring up to 10 five-gallon containers of flood-related hazardous materials to the State of Vermont collection site in Middlesex. After Saturday, this Saturday, Vermonters will need to contact their local solid waste management entity for a list of drop-off locations and dates for the seasonal collection events. That's all for today. I will turn things over to General Roy from FEMA. Thank you, ma'am. Governor? Good morning. Under the current major disaster declaration, FEMA is supporting Vermont to meet the immediate needs after the storms and to help kick off recovery. We're working with Vermont's communities to assess the damages from the storms in order to provide funding under the Public Assistance Program. We're also working with Governor's staff to assess the need for temporary housing. As of today, 4,535 residents have applied for assistance, resulting in over $11.6 million in financial aid. FEMA conducts follow-up calls with every applicant. As of today, we have contacted over 1,000 applicants, resulting to close to an additional $1 million in funding uh, as we update their status. To find out if you're eligible for assistance, you can call FEMA at 1-800-621-3362, 1-800-621-3362, or you can visit one of our disaster recovery centers for in-person assistance. The deadline for assistance is September 12th. In addition to the five dis disaster recovery centers already open in Barrie, Barton, Rutland, Springfield, and Waterbury, we're opening up four new, new centers this week at the following locations. In Wyndham County at the Jamaica Fire Department in Jamaica tomorrow, in Caledonia County at the Dan Danville K-12 School in Danville tomorrow, in Lamoille County at the North Northern Vermont University, McClellan Hall, on Thursday, 
And finally, in Washington County at the Vermont College of Fine Arts, uh, 36 College Street in Montpelier on Friday. To date, FEMA has approved more than $11.6 million in assistance and actually dispersed into people's bank accounts $11.2 million. Our disaster survivor assistance teams going door to door have visited over 17,000 homes in 83 of the hardest hit communities in the nine declared counties for individual assistance. And lastly, our partners at the Small Business Administration have approved 139 loans for a total of $6.2 million to homeowners, renters, and businesses. Thank you, and I'll be followed by Secretary Flynn. Secretary, I would like to uh, compliment you, having driven all over Vermont looking at our DRCs. Um, it's just absolutely phenomenal the work that your staff are doing. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'll give you an update on the current situation on state-owned infrastructure. Today, four roads remain fully closed, and those are Vermont Route 116 in Middlebury, I-91 northbound in Hartford, the off-ramp to 89, Vermont 131 in Wethersfield, and Vermont 125 in Hancock. Seven roads remain partially open. One road was reopened yesterday from damage caused by the storm. Now that road is Vermont 110. It had four different sites that were damaged. Those have all been uh, repaired with temporary bridges. However, I want to note Vermont 110 had a VTRANS construction project prior to the storm. So in East Barry near the roundabout, it's still closed from that project. One road has also fully closed during the storm, which is Vermont 125 in Hancock. Over the weekend, we had to turn a bridge into one lane due to some rain damage that occurred Friday night and the damage was more extensive than we thought, so it's a full closure at this time. Since the beginning of the storm, 143 state roads have reopened, which were once closed. The one bridge that remains closed is the one I just mentioned a moment ago on Vermont 125 in Hancock. Our bridge inspectors at AOT inspected 13 bridges yesterday for a total now of 565 bridges statewide that have been inspected. And I will give you some data as we close out the first month. This pertains to work that AOT has done on state-owned infrastructure. So far, we've identified 1,102 damaged sites on our road or bridge network, 826 impaired or I'm sorry, impacted culverts. We have performed 142,000 linear feet of ditch work, 20 miles of new paving. And of the bridges I told you that we inspected, 280 of those have been in rural Vermont communities. We have so far used 366 thousand pounds of rock, installed 7,000 feet of guardrail, and worked on 236 slopes or slides. Again, all just on the state network. I had mentioned a week or so back that of our active construction projects prior to the storm, we did incur some damage on those sites. Initially, 12 sites were damaged. We have recovered 11 of those and are preparing them to resume. Initially, five projects were um, stopped so that contractors could move on to help towns in an urgent situation. Two, have, two of those five have now restored. Uh, three still remain stopped. 
with respect to active railroad, 11.17 miles remains closed. And that is the piece through Barrie up to Websterville. Public transit, we still continue to maintain free service between Johnson and Morrisville and Hardwick in Morrisville. There are no issues at the state-owned airports. There are no issues on the two state-owned dams. Today, AOT is working in 28 rural Vermont communities, working with the towns. And we are also joined today by 39 private contractors on AOT projects. I'd like to give you uh, an update and close on some good news with respect to the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. We are very pleased to officially announce the reopening of more than one half of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail runs from St. Johnsbury to Swanton and is approximately 93 miles in length and twin. The 30.3 mile section from Swanton to Cambridge Junction is now fully open for public use. The 19.5 mile section from St. Johnsbury to Walden is now fully open for public use. These openings represent 49.8 miles of the entire length of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. AOT anticipates reopening additional sections of the trail during the next several weeks and months and into next year. You'll see on the screen some of the damage that we've encountered along the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. There are six different slides that I believe will rotate on the screen. The remaining 43.2 miles of the LVRT between Cambridge and Walden remain closed until further notice due to many different types of damage including complete bridge washouts, complete culvert washouts, and severe slope failures that are blocking the trail or have washed out the trail entirely. A total of 103 sites remain damaged and closed. The agency has hired contractors for 57 of the sites as of this point and is working to get the remaining work under contract for repair very soon. Among the damaged sites that are still closed, 16 will require civil engineering and will be long-term projects with repairs that are not likely to be completed until sometime in the early part of 2024. The next immediate area of focus will be the 15-mile segment from Cambridge Junction to Morrisville. This section will have an expected reopening early this fall which we will announce in time. The remaining fully closed segments of the trail are just that. They are fully closed. All trail users must not access these areas due to active construction for your own safety. Although some areas appear passable, the surface and embankments may be compromised and could present unforeseen hazards. We have a website. Vermont Rail Trail System website. I will read it. It's https colon backslash backslash railtrails.vermont.gov backslash trail hyphen updates backslash. But I could provide that to you in writing. That concludes my report. Thank you, Governor. Who's up next? Oh, I'm sorry, Matthew. Yeah. I was supposed to introduce Matthew D. Giovanni. Matthew is the head of engineering and operations for the Federal Highway Division for the Vermont Division Office. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Secretary Flynn, uh, Governor Scott, and uh, Chief Engineer Gamel for their leadership and partnership throughout the response and recovery. Um, on behalf of Secretary Buttigieg, uh, Federal Highway Administrator Shailen Bott, uh, Division Administrator Randy Warden, and all of Federal Highway, both 
in D.C. and Vermont. Um, I will emphasize that working uh, with the states to help people reassemble their lives, uh, which often starts with restoring roads and bridges after the devastating floods, is a priority for President Biden and uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, when disaster strikes, transportation is critically important to recovering communities. It is how supplies get in and out of those in need of medical care and <laughs> how those in need of medical care get to the doctor. Um, federal support is key to getting states and local communities back up and running again, alongside helping people return to their daily lives and regain a sense of normalcy. Um, on July 11th, I think as been noted, uh, President Biden approved an emergency declaration for Vermont, which authorizes the Stafford Disaster Act, uh, Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act to save lives, protect property, um, public health and safety, and to lessen or avert the threat of a, cat a catastrophe in the state. Um, Federal Highway Administration works regularly with VTRANS on uh, working on uh, putting out regular projects, but in this case, um, Federal Highways Emergency Relief Program reimburses states for expenses associated with damage from natural disasters or other emergency situations. Uh, emergency relief funding is relied upon by the states and has helped them rebuild in the aftermath of extreme weather and other catastrophic events that slam their communities. As our nation faces more frequent and unpredictable damage uh, from severe weather events, the devastating impacts of climate change are evident. These funds uh, will help states respond to these incidents as we work to build more sustainable transportation infrastructure that can better withstand these impacts for the years to come. Um, I just want to say thank you for your continued partnership and uh, we look forward to continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, again, without our federal partners, uh, we would be uh, very much challenged, more challenged than we are today. So my thanks to FEMA and FHWA for their continued support in our recovery. Uh, but we have a long ways to go. As uh, Joe had mentioned, uh, he was mentioning all the amounts of stone and paving and guardrail and so forth. And that's just in our, you know, response. Uh, we still have permanent uh, more permanent work to do um, that we're going to stretch into probably the next construction season. With that, I'll open up to questions. Do we have any updates on the license plate rollouts? Um, yeah, the, the details will be coming um, fairly soon. I'd say next week we'll have more for you. Governor, you talked about the start of this long-term recovery work. I know you said that you're working with engineers from the infrastructure and highway side of things, but does your administration plan to work with urban engineers or civil engineers about redesigning these communities or thinking how and where we should rebuild? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're we're starting those uh, conversations as we as we speak today. So uh, so we're moving forward and trying to have uh, those conversations again with our congressional de delegation uh, because a supplemental uh, amount will be needed for uh, some of those projects that we are envisioning. And contemplating, so um, so we'll see where it goes. But uh, we're we are very much uh, looking forward um, in uh, in terms of how do we protect ourselves more in the future. And, and when you think about that in the long term, I mean, what what does that look like from a, a mitigation, uh, architectural, design, planning perspective? Yeah, it's it's about uh, letting the water do what it needs to do, um, and finding places for it to store. Uh, as well as protecting buildings uh, from uh, future damage and uh, and not building in areas where we should so again it's all across the board um, it's uh, it's fairly complicated when you start thinking about the hy hydraulics and hydrology um, but um, but I think that there you know other we're going to learn from other states we're going to learn from some of uh, what we have experienced in the past what we've done right I would use uh, the the Waterbury Complex as a as a uh, an example of what we did right, um, and uh, that sustained this flooding uh, at this point in time. So we're going to have to do more of that, um, but uh, but we've had some success stories, and and other states have had success stories as well. So we'll learn from them, and um, you know mitigate uh, for the future. What's the status of Addison County as far as uh, individual assistance? Yeah, we uh, at this point in time uh, have not met that threshold, uh, and 
again with this newest event, um, and this might be for um, for Will Roy um, from FEMA. But typically, uh, as I've I think I've explained in the past, typically FEMA will look at the storm system one storm system, and that's the event. Um, and that was the case with Irene. We had one event, and uh, everything was covered under that declaration. This is a little different. Um, we have had multiple, multiple systems uh, that have came in rapid fire after the, the uh, initial event and created more damage. But everything has to come to an end in, term, in FEMA's eyes. I mean, they're trying to, to contain this. Um, we are making the argument and will continue to make the argument that with the saturated soils that we have, uh, that that's what's creating some of the impacts that we're seeing in Middlebury, Rutland, and so forth. I heard uh, we uh, had the National Weather Service on for my daily briefing uh, this morning, and it was an interesting fact uh, that stuck with me uh, because they said we received in the in the valley last night, uh, Waitsfield, uh, Warren Valley, um, we received an inch of rain last night. And typically, under normal circumstances, that one inch of rain would elevate the Mad River about a foot to foot and a half. That's what it would elevate that, that river to. Yesterday, last night, we received an inch of rain, inch and inch and a half of rain, and it, and it rose five feet. Um, so that just tells you everything that we're challenged by, uh, the saturated soils. There's nowhere for the water to go. Um, it goes into the river and elevates, and that creates the flooding. So again, I believe um, we're in unusual times, but by FEMA standards, we have to contain this and end it sometime. And we may have to seek another declaration if we, if we can meet that threshold. But again, we're working out those details. We're still trying. We want people to still report to 211 um, so that we can determine whether we can uh, meet another uh, declaration or another threshold uh, so that we can uh, create another opportunity in a, in a separate county. But so far, they have not met that. Even for this latest one? We don't, don't know at this point. Um, we haven't Do you think the that. most um, prudent thing to do would be to file an appeal um, to get this added to the initial or request a new disaster yeah. declaration? We are, we are contemplating all of the above, uh, what the best approach is. And again, it's not that they're being difficult, it's just that those are the guidelines and they have to follow them. And we're, we're trying to, again, during this uh, uh, unusual time and unusual events, uh, we're trying to make the case that this one's different and it may be different in the future. Do you think those guidelines should change now with this new climate reality? I think, that I think that's something Congress will have to uh, to anticipate and talk about. Um, it's out of our control. It's out of FEMA's control. It's really, it's really about Congress making some decisions about what to do next. Will, do you want to add anything to that? It's always hard to phone the government on those, but. Uh, um, as, as the governor said, um, we are clearly recognizing that the weather patterns uh, have certainly changed um, recently. Um, if we look back on the history of FEMA, um, certainly since the stand-up of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, everybody turns to Katrina uh, as a guideline, right? A lot of people don't recognize that or realize that one of the things that impacted FEMA uh, under Katrina was actually the restructuring of this new department of DHS, right? Which, which, um, which the Congress recognizes, recognized, and and restructured what FEMA can do under the post-Katrina Reform Act. It, so every major disaster system, the Congress looks at, at the authorities that has given FEMA uh, and adjusts it. We saw the same thing under Sandy, uh, and then we saw the same thing under Maria. Uh, so. Uh, it is the Congress that, that looks at it and it makes, you know, authority changes for FEMA so that we can execute uh, its intent. Um, and as the governor said, you know, we're recognizing that for Vermont, I mean, this is a historic uh, summer for, for, for flooding. Um, and, you know, the delegation uh, can utilize its authorities in Congress to, to put forward changes. And I'm sure many other states 
are looking at this the same way. Did you say uh, that after the one inch of rainfall, there's normally it, it raises ab about a foot? That's what they said, uh, the oh. National Weather Service said, in the, in the valley and uh, with, uh, uh, with that river in particular, with oh, the Mad River. Um, I'm wondering if in, in the Budget Adjustment Act talks you have with the legislature this fall, will you be asking them to reallocate some of the current funding to flood recovery? Well, the budget adjustment, we wouldn't be having those conversations until January. Um, okay. We'll continue to utilize the resources we have at this point in time. But is that a possibility in January? We'll okay. see. I mean, again, I don't want to take away from our efforts, uh, long-term efforts, uh, with some of the ARPA dollars that we had already designated and, uh, and appropriated. So, um, so again, we're putting a lot of uh, our eggs in the congressional basket and uh, hopefully uh, they will be able to receive or, and obtain um, uh, another capital expenditure uh, out of the Congress. Speaking of Congress, um, what's the status with the special appropriation? Or I know they're on recess right now, but where yeah, is that No, stand? they're still trying to put that together, waiting for information from us uh, to give to them. Um, we are in constant dialogue with them and they've been uh, very willing to hear uh, any of the initiatives that we have uh, have contemplated, and they're, they'll be putting that together during their break um, to uh, to present. Do you foresee it, if, based on your conversations right now, that it would be introduced very shortly after they return? And I think it's the conference. better question for them. I, I don't know uh, how that will work and how their uh, rules, and whether you can just introduce a bill or not. I just don't don't understand their their process yeah nor do I care to could we get Commissioner Morrison back for a second for a little bit more details on I, I think you mentioned 35 evacuations due to recent rain could you offer just more details on that so between Thursday and Friday there there were uh, 35 evacuations. I believe those were mostly in Rutland. Uh, there was definitely an active rescue from a person trapped in a car in Middlebury. Uh, and in fact, three people on the roof of a car, I believe, in Middlebury. I will get you the details because I have to say they're starting to smush together <laughs> at this point. So you want specifically to know what the activity was in Rutland versus Middlebury? Yeah, just looking at the picture. Sure, happy to do that. Flooding or landslides? Uh, flooding, I believe it was related to a water main break, but again, I'll get you the details. Have there been any landslides in Addison and Rutland counties in the past couple days? A couple days, uh, not in the last couple days. There were a couple that were reported as landslides, but upon investigation, they were not, okay. they were determined not to be landslides, but uh, that's that was Ripton. Ripton area, yeah. And Hancock, yep. Hancock and Ripton were the two that come to mind. Okay, great, but, thank you. Did you also get information about the damage to the swift boat and how that occurred and whether? Yeah, it was anecdotally, okay? it was um, the water rose so high and they were making a rescue, and I believe it's a, like a rib craft type boat, uh, uh, not fiberglass, the soft sided boats, and it got hung up on a fence and it ripped it out. But I can get you more detail on the nature of the damage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for the governor, if that's okay. <clears throat> Governor, you were getting ready to ride the rail trail before this storm, and I think you take a lot of pride in the fact that the state put years and years of work into getting that trail up and running. It must be very disappointing to see the damage. Those pictures were heartbreaking to that trail. Tell me what's going through your mind when you see a marquee infrastructure project in the state just shredded by yeah. a storm like this. Yeah, very discouraging in, in many respects, um, but, uh, but we'll re rebuild, and we built it this time we'll rebuild it again um, but um, but my you know it's difficult for the communities that we're really counting on this to tie them together for their economic development and uh, and so um, personally you know it's, it's, it's discouraging but for them it could be devastating economically um, and so we're going to have to go back in there as quick as we can uh, obviously, uh, we wanted to make sure the road infrastructure was uh, was passable, and we we're putting all our resources there uh, and, and uh, efforts there. 
but now we can move uh, to another phase so that we can start rebuilding those sections. Infrastructure like that is particularly vulnerable to flooding, isn't it? With the way that trail sort of hues to the, the riverbank in many locations, can yeah. you just opine or maybe Joe or others explain how you'd go about rebuilding a trail that's essentially sort of right on the banks of a, of a big river in the state? And, well, again, it's it's uh, it's on the rail bed, uh, yeah. so if it had impacted, it would have impacted the rail right. as well. Um, but some of these, it's different in different locations. Uh, some of it was uh, debris getting hung up in in the abutments. Uh, some of it was slides, as you as you saw, and uh, we'll just have to rip wrap uh, some of those sections, harden the banks, uh, so that we can rebuild all the way up through uh, to the to the top of the rails. This one doesn't look easy to rip wrap and get back up and running anytime soon. But it, but really it, sort of yeah, it's like a permanent sort of. It, it will. We, I would say that that can be fixed. Um, I'm not ready to put a dollar amount on that yet, but. Well, you, I mean, you've got experience in moving yeah. earth and sort of these sort of civil engineering projects, and so I just wanted to sort of, as we talk about rebuilding, right? Calvin's asking questions about how you rebuild to be more resilient. There's a perfect example of a piece of infrastructure that's in tatters. We've got to rebuild it, but you can't move it, right? I mean, you can't just move it over 50 yards to get it out of the floodplain. Like, how do you go about rebuilding infrastructure that is almost certain to be in the same location as it used to be? I mean, yeah. Can you raise that thing three feet? That seems well, again, this failure probably, I'd let the engineers decide that, but the failure started here, not there. You know, that slid down, so that it was probably the river is probably down here and undermined uh, the slope, and and that caused the the failure. So hardening this down here is key to to fixing that up there. I had a similar question when I was driving in past. Um, for, I guess this question for Joe. Um, driving in from Waterbury past Montpelier, I saw the section of I-89 that, that you know, failed during the floods and then you've repaired it. But it, is that repair going to hold up in the next flood? I mean, it looks like a patch mm -hmm. of the exact spot that uh, was undermined by that water coming off that cliff. How, how do you fix a highway that's in a narrow channel between two cliffs of granite or whatever, I mean, how do you do that? You probably will have to go back to the source as well, yeah. you know, finding out where, why it came out over on the ledge like it did and maybe be able to divert it down to where there's a, a culvert, a main culvert underneath the, the highway instead of coming out, out over, the, uh, over the ledge and onto 89. I, I noticed that water pouring off that ledge the morning of the very first press conference that was held at the EOC in Waterbury as I drove from here to there. And, and like the governor said, maybe understanding where that water came from, I mean obviously enough rain is going to cause water to flow and, and we, you're right, we're not going to move the interstate and we're probably not going to move the ledge. And that sort of, uh, while that closed the road, which is rare, for the interstate. Um, those types of damages along the edge of the road that sometimes undermine guardrail posts are not that uncommon around the state of Vermont during summer storms. I think that our focus on them now is acute because of the totality of the storm damage. Um, but that clearly was uh, a mess and, and I also saw pictures where there were what looked to be in some cases almost basketball sized rocks that had come down as well as standing water so that was why it was closed and of the 143 roads that I think I mentioned that have reopened since the start of this many of them were fully inundated and you know mother nature floods them and then mother nature lets that water recede and we're often left with what's what was done to them so you know we're we're not going to move the road we're not going to move the rail trail, but we've heard this before, you know, especially New England, we developed our communities along river for power, for transportation. That's where roads were built. That's where railroads were built. And um, times have changed. 
and so now we have to deal with the consequences of, of this weather. Governor, I want to ask you about um, the issues with 211. Um, the United Ways of Vermont put out a statement yesterday evening um, saying that 10 days before the disaster, 211 cut back hours and decreased staffing uh, due to a lack of funding. Roughly 90% of um, 211's budget comes from state contracts, and that funding has not increased for the past five years. Um, do you have a response to their? Yeah, I, I think it, what I said before still holds true. Um, we didn't know that they were being inundated. They didn't communicate that with us. Had we known they were inundated and that they couldn't, couldn't uh, answer the calls, we would have sent in help earlier. Uh, so that was key, the communication piece. Uh, if they told us, we would have helped and, uh, and been able to bring in some resources uh, to get through this emergency period. So um, I think if you look back uh, today or yesterday, uh, now I think they had, uh, I heard on the briefing this morning, they had 62 calls total for the day. Uh, that they can handle. Um, during the extreme emergency, obviously they were inundated and overwhelmed, but that's when they need to call us for help so that we can help out during those emergency situations. We can't be ready, um, we have to have a plan for when that happens uh, and be able to act on that plan. Um, and thus conversations we'll probably have uh, with them uh, in the uh, legislative session to determine what, what is their plan when you can't meet the needs. And then what do we do to, to supplement that to help get through those tough periods? Because it's not an everyday thing. Um, 62 calls in a day is something they should be able to handle. When we went through the pandemic, they were receiving 30, 40 calls a day, something like that. So, so we just need a plan uh, to put together so that we can handle the emergencies when they come about. So you think that the, the funding that 211 is currently receiving um, and their staffing, which was recently cut back, is adequate? in the long term? Well, again, that's what they have to present to us in the legislature to determine whether under normal circumstances do they have enough resources to handle the calls. And then how do they ramp up? Can they ramp up? Or do we have to search for a different mechanism? Are we going to have to do something different? Are we going to have to uh, utilize a, a, a different platform rather than United Way? If United Way can't do it, we, we may have to look in a different direction. So the CEO of uh, United Way of Northwestern Vermont, Elizabeth Gilman, did tell the House Appropriations Committee in April um, regarding the funding situation, quote, it would dramatically limit our ability to support Vermont emergency management and the Agency of Human Services emergency management around times of disaster and emergency need. So that was said to the legislature back in April. I still maintain that everyone has to have a plan for an emergency. So if they were inundated, they weren't able to, to answer the calls, which we didn't know, then they should have contacted us to help them so that we could answer the calls and we could put resources in to make sure we're getting back to people. But we can't help if we didn't, we didn't know about it. But I think they did communicate that. Back in April, they said that uh, we're I mean, I'm happen. talking about during this emergency. This emergency situation, when you find yourself in trouble and you're not answering the calls, you have to communicate that with us, with the SEOC, so that they know that there's a problem and then we can fix it or attempt to fix it. I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying that they, whether their resources were enough or not is almost immaterial at this point. It's that they need to tell us when they were in a situation that they couldn't work their way out of. We had no idea. But once we found out, we were able to send in resources and be able to help out. So that's what we need. We just need to develop plans um, to, to make sure during those times, because you don't want to staff up uh, like there's going to be an emergency every single day. You're going to have to have a plan because there, there are many weeks and months where we don't have anything. And that would be a waste of resources. 
say cut back on staffing in hours? I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that we need to develop a plan. They need to develop a plan uh, during those times um, so that they can act on it and then answer the calls when there's an emergency. If they can't do it, if they have no means of doing that, we're going to have to contemplate how we how we work that through. Maybe United Way isn't the right entity to oversee 211. I don't know. That's something the legislature is going to have to consider. Um, if they simply can't do it, then we, we're going to have to figure another way to, to accomplish that. But I'm saying you can't you can't have you can't be on uh, emergency status 24 7 365 uh, you have to have a means to ramp up during those emergencies uh, you you mentioned that the state is going to kind of jump start some of its recovery efforts using arpa funds can you or doug maybe talk a little bit about sort of what that will look like you know what what projects will receive ARPA and, and sort of how the money is going to move around? Well, again, we are going to continue to move forward with the plans that we already have uh, for the ARPA money. And we're going to make sure that they, we focus on the areas where that money could be utilized in, in ways uh, to, uh, to address two things at once. Doug, is that something you want to? Responded. So I think the important thing here is that we have a large portfolio of ARPA projects that are still moving forward, hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure style projects, water, sewer, broadband, housing. Those are all going to have to intersect with our flood recovery efforts. So we, we're not going to stop those things, but we need to make them work well together and make sense together. And in some cases, we'll be able to, to move a community forward even more by combining a flood recovery effort with those ARPA efforts. So I think that's the main thing we want to look for here is where are the opportunities to really move a community forward in the right path so that they'll be more resilient in the future, so that they have the right amount of housing, and so that we don't have to worry about this damage down the road. Now, we can't prevent the possibility of flood damage. That's not something that really can ever be done. But we can harden and mitigate as much as possible and, like the governor said, give the river space, let the river do what it wants to do, as much as possible, keeping in mind we have our historic pattern of development and we can only move so quickly around that historic pattern and we have to respect our historic buildings and downtowns. When rebuilding some of those areas and using that ARPA money, I mean, do you envision like more going to some of these flood uh, ravaged areas as opposed to like southern Vermont? Like, are, are, do you see that communities might lose out or, uh, you know, yeah, lose out on, on ARPA funds? might have been coming their way, if not for the flood. I think that there are 83 communities where we have damage, and we need to go in and understand how they are going to best rebuild. So they may have small amounts of damage where we can recover, repair, and there might not be that much mitigation or transformation necessary. Other communities might be on the other end of the spectrum where they're going to need to transform quite a bit. And I think we, we reached a, a very good understanding with the legislature of the goals of the ARPA portfolio. I think Vermont did a great job of negotiating a really thoughtful package of ARPA investment that's gotten some national praise, actually. So we don't want to just do a sharp left turn on that. right? We want to see how consistent we can stay with that package. And then if we have to make adjustments, we want to talk about those. But I don't think we want to assume that we're going to undermine or dramatically shift how we spend the ARPA state fiscal recovery money. I'm going to go to the phones. I think we've got two on the line. We'll start with uh, Keith, the Rutland Herald. Hi. Um, yeah, so I saw an email from FEMA the other day. It made me think of this. They were hiring a uh, several positions to sort of address some of the flood recovery. But it made me wonder, um, overall, uh, was our, our previous labor shortage impacting our recovery effort here in any way? Does anybody know that? Or? Well, I think it, from my standpoint, I think it, uh, that it will. Um, it's going to, the duration is going to be longer, I think, in the recovery, uh, because we have a lot of skilled uh, labor uh, that is already committed in many, many different ways. And uh, we have the ARPA dollars, uh, the IIJA, 
uh, the traditional infrastructure through uh, through VTrans and BGS and so forth, and uh, and we have a limited pool of uh, of those uh, in the trades. And so I I believe it will take a little longer to get through this recovery and do all the other things that we need to do as well. And it's something we've been highlighting for the last seven years: uh, a lack of workforce, lack of specifically in the trades, um, and it's coming. It's coming to roost at this point in time, and I think we're going to be seeing that more and more as time goes on. Uh, would Mr. Roy happen to know if um, FEMA is having any trouble recruiting for those positions, or is that is that filling up pretty? I don't know if um, the short-term nature of this really. I don't know if the same pressures apply. Normally. Um, makes any sense. Yeah, unfortunately, it's too early to say. Uh, the advertisements went out. Um, and uh, they haven't closed, so we're waiting to see how many uh, people are interested in the short-term 120-day positions. Thank you. Where did they apply? Online, sir. Thank you. If we can just convince the 400 and something FEMA employees to stay in Vermont, uh, that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Governor, I have a well, let me just do one. I think we have uh, one more on the phone. Let me go back to the room. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. You know, um, the uh, electric utilities had a really tough time last winter with, with their storms and in, in a whole different manner of storms. Is this going to set back the, the progress trying to be made on, on um, the transmission? And, and that sort of thing, because all this money and effort is going into, you know, this, this storm mitigation. I, I don't believe so, Tim. Uh, different buckets of money, um, different skills, uh, different labor force in that, you know, pretty specialized in that area. So I, d I don't believe that will impact uh, the, uh, the upgrades of, of any of the infrastructure in that regard. Does it feel like it's just one thing after another now? It does these, these days, yes. Uh, very much so. All right, thanks, Kevin. Look. Back to the room for maybe a couple more. This is a completely non flight question. <clears throat> um, has the health department or the agency of education decided on whether COVID-19 vaccinations will be on the required schedule for school children? I, d I don't believe so, but that is a question. I think it was uh, Dr. Levine is on that panel, I believe. I, I don't think I can answer that today, uh, but uh, I can get the answer or get Dr. Levine to, to call you. Governor, from your view, what do you think the relationship will be like in terms of the state and individual municipalities, in terms of the mitigation and rebuilding conversation, just how much power will municipalities have to come to say, you know, this is how our area needs to rebuild? Like, what, what will that relationship look like? Yeah, we want to work hand in hand with the communities. Uh, and that's what, you know, this administration, what I've been talking about for quite some time, especially those rural communities uh, that have been long forgotten. And that's why we wanted to spread out the ARPA money geographically across uh, the state uh, so that it's not just the northwest part of the state that we focus on. It's the other, you know, 11, 12 counties uh, that need our help desperately. So we need to have uh, conversations with them. We are having conversations with them. We've been out on our ARPA tour uh, for the last year. Uh, so. Uh, now we have to go back and, and see if that's still the same, whether they want to focus on the same, uh, they have the same vision, and uh, we'll work hand in hand with them so that we all win, because they're vital uh, to our revitalization efforts uh, throughout Vermont. The revitalization efforts of Vermont are, are really integrated with the communities, rural communities in particular. So you think there's enough to go around for them all to win? I believe it's never enough, uh, but it's a great start. Yes. Back to the labor force and the flood recovery kind of point at a joint hearing between the House and Senate Economic Development Committees the week before last, Senator Keisha Ron Hensdale kind of floated the idea of a Works Progress Administration type civilian conservation corps. 
and specifically pulling tech students out of the classroom and having them, you know, out in the field doing work um, to rebuild. I wonder what you make of that idea. I have to learn more about that. Obviously, anything we can do to engage uh, those in the tech uh, lab in that in that field uh, would be advantageous to us. Uh, maybe getting them out sooner is is good. Uh, on you know, with boots on the ground, I think uh, you learn a lot in that regard. It could be an opportunity, uh, but it won't be near enough. Uh, I mean, our our labor shortage is is severe, and uh, and a lot of it is due to the lack of the number of people in Vermont. Uh, so um, maybe a great idea, uh, but it doesn't satisfy, come anywhere near to satisfying the need that we have. I, I just have a follow-up. Maybe it's for Commissioner Morrison about rubbish removal. Um, as, as you know, some you mentioned like mobile home parks. I'm just thinking of the one in Berlin, right? It's pri one of them, at least, is privately owned. In that case, who's responsible, you know, for, for hauling away the, the trash? Is that the town or is that the, the park owner? With great delight, I'm going to tell you that this is the governor's bailiwick, not mine. <laughs> um, well, you can certainly supplement part of this. <laughs> um, but the bottom line, let's get to the bottom line first. Uh, for those mobile homes, uh, that are no longer usable, are dilapidated, can no longer be utilized and need to be deconstructed. Uh, we are putting together a plan um, that will be implemented very soon uh, that will be at no cost to the owner. So regardless of what happens, no cost to the owner uh, to, to take care of these, uh, these homes in the mobile home parks at this point. Um, so as it's our understanding that the debris, um, the debris will be um, paid for by FEMA, uh, if because it's debris that is that is from the flood itself. Um, but it have to be de deconstructed, put out in the right of way, and then we'll have to take it away from there. But they have to be deconstructed first, and and taken apart and recycled. Uh, the materials that can be recycled will be recycled as a result, much like we did during Irene. So, so deconstructing and the disposal of the possessions and of the home will be covered by FEMA. Can you explain no, that? No, some of the, it won't be all. The, the debris itself uh, will be covered by FEMA, but not the deconstruction. But we will, we have, uh, we have resources that we're going to tap into. We'll talk a little bit more about it next week uh, that we're going to utilize so that there is no cost to the, to the owner, at least from that, that respect. Will that potentially cover their rehousing or finding new shelter costs associated that's with that? another that's another conversation in another area so uh, we'll, I'm going to stay in this lane for for right now and we'll have those conversations uh, further uh, but uh, but there is some opportunity um, I don't know if we're ready to talk about that or not but uh, there are some temporary um, shelters coming uh, that that are mobile home related, um, but we can't put them back in the same place because it's in a floodway. So we are actively pursuing other opportunities uh, to place these so that we can rehouse people. Do you want to add anything to that at this sure. point? Thank you, Governor. Uh, we're awaiting the, the request from the state for uh, direct uh, housing. Uh, there are a number of different means that we use for that. Um, first, uh, we look for multi-family units to be able to either lease or, if they've been damaged, repaired uh, to, to place residents. Um, we also have a program for direct lease, so if there are uh, locations that are available uh, for us to lease, we can lease those. Um, and then the last course, everybody knows the FEMA trailers. Um, and uh, so those, those are an option as well. Uh, each of them each of them really is tied to the individual themselves. Uh, typically, we'll start with a very large population relative um, to how many people are interested in FEMA assisting them to find housing solutions. But along the way, many people find housing solutions on their own. And so at the end of the day, what you end up with is, is a much smaller set of individuals who will need your assistance. 
Uh, those people who are already receiving rental assistance, if they've got a place to stay, they can utilize those funds for up to 18 months, which is the same for the direct housing mission from FEMA as well. It's a short-term uh, process while they find a permanent living solution. Thank you. Uh, just a few weeks before the flood, there was a massive pink pig that was blown up on Church Street in Burlington, and it was a it was a PR stunt by Beeper. They wanted to sort of call attention to the greed of big oil, and they launched a summer campaign called "Make Big Oil Pay." And their pitch was, "Let's find a way to make the companies that are responsible for the fossil fuel emissions." that they knew were going to be a problem for the climate, but they sold anyway. Let's make them pay for Vermont's damage from climate-fueled storms. 25 years, $2.5 billion climate super fund of some kind. They're out there pushing that to voters right now. They're out there telling voters that we need to do this in Vermont, and they're going to be pushing lawmakers in the next session to try to find a way to do that. Does, do any of these storms and the damage that you've witnessed make you think that maybe something along those lines, if not exactly that, something in the direction of getting Vermont access to some additional funding beyond just the federal government is a wise move or, or possible? Well, again, I think this is something the Attorney General should take a look at, probably will take a look at. Uh, it's uh, in her, um, her bailiwick. Um, I tend to want to look forward. Uh, you know, we put a lot of effort into I believe climate change is real. I believe that we should be moving uh, to a, another, you know, transitioning away from fossil fuels, uh, carbon emitting fuels, and move to this new electric society. Um, but it's going to take some time. Uh, and but we've started, and uh, and I think it's in the transportation sector, um, but it will also be in every other sector as well. Um, so. We'll focus our efforts on uh, doing just that, and we'll let the um, Attorney Generals of the world uh, figure out whether we should be involved in a lawsuit or not. That's a but big... the transition you're describing is going to take billions and billions of dollars, even if you just... And the repair of the infrastructure of the state that may, it may endure over the next decade, multiple decades, it's going to take billions and billions of dollars. What do you think about the general premise? That, that we're going to need some help funding-wise. Yeah. Sort of well, again, um, I think taking on uh, big oil uh, by the Attorney General and many Attorney Generals is going to be a daunting effort as well, probably a long-term effort. I don't think it's instantaneous. I'm not sure that they're going to be help, be able to have help for us uh, in the immediate future, but maybe sometime long down the road when most of us are out of office. We'll see. Kevin's earlier questions is it's going to be hard to mitigate a lot of these areas near rivers like the rail trail like the railroad um, Secretary Flynn I know you mentioned a lot of the bridge infrastructure did hold up since Irene um, because a lot of things that you guys did just this might be a better question for you but just what pieces of infrastructure what areas are you maybe excited about or you think could benefit the most from um, these mitigation efforts specifically sure. Well, you mentioned bridges, and clearly that was an area that we were fortunate to not see as much damage this time as last. <clears throat> I think at one time the maximum number we had was four, and during Irene it was 34. Um, I will say, too, when I was reading the data, I think I said something like impacted culverts somewhere like 876 in my talking points. Every single culvert or box structure that we've replaced, we've attempted to replace it bigger, even during this emergency response. That's not always possible because you've got to match the availability of material with the demand to fix what you're trying to get going. But every single place we could, we've upsized right then and there. So that's an example, I think, of, of how we look at things differently than, than might have been looked at before Irene. And then with respect to the structures, <clears throat> uh, I can tell you that while I don't have the size of the pipe that is under Route 116 by Dow Pond Dam in Middlebury, 
I can tell you that that is going to go to a 12 by 15 foot rectangle, 125 feet long. <clears throat> it is massive in size, <clears throat> significantly larger than what was there. So much so that we're actually working with our neighbors in New York State DOT to access some of those pieces expeditiously, which we will replace. So it's, it's thinking like that. <clears throat> We've also worked with DEC. We've worked with the Rivers Engineers ever, and I, they did before Irene, but they've worked much closer together since Irene, as I think I mentioned in a previous press conference, to take a look at uh, hydrology. The governor mentioned hydrology before. And can we design a bridge fix that doesn't have a pier in the middle of the stream like that might have been engineered 80 or 100 years ago when it was first built? But it just takes a different type of engineering. And so those accomplishments go on daily but they just are never highlighted unless there's an event like this that someone like me points to one of them and says, there's an example. But the, the, the engineers are looking at this every single day as they build things. Yep. Thank you all.